uh, assistance space, think ChatGPT, um, or of course Entropic, Google Assistant, and Bard, um, Perplexity, I guess, and all, all these other companies, looking into really like how can we help you with getting the information you need, solving a task you need, so on. Uh, that's one aspect. Another group of companies are going after AI companionship, AI friendship, one on one, long term. Us, Pi, Inflection, maybe some other smaller companies. Then there's also uh, fictional characters. Uh, so, AI so I guess, for so I guess within, within the AI companion space, would you think? Are, do you think all these companies are solving for loneliness, or do you think they're solving for like tutor? Would you put tutor as part of AI companion, or no? That's like separate categories. Oh, no, these are completely different. And I think this is okay. the, a big mistake is to try to bucket them all in one group. Okay. Assistants are one very distinct, you know, you only go there when you need to get some information, you need to uh, generate some content, you need to summarize. You have a very particular task in mind. Yeah. Here's what I need to do. You turn to an AI companion when you want to build a connection. Mm-hmm. Um, and people should not confuse talking about their emotions with building a connection with mm-hmm. uh an emotional connection with someone because you can talk about your emotions with a counselor, with a coach, uh, even with an assistant, but it doesn't mean that you have a deep emotional connection with this thing. Think mm-hmm. of it like, um, uh, emotional support, whatever crisis hotline, you know, you're talking about your emotions yet, you know, not really trying to build a relationship with an anonymous voice on the other side. And I think a lot of people are not understanding that, that emotional connection comes with feelings. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. no feeling in between you and the, AI, there's no product there. That's not going to be an emotional connection. Um, and so I feel a lot of products kind of fall in between the two chairs, trying to build um, an emotional assistant or whatever, or an AI friend. We're trying to build an AI friend, but really ending up building an emotional assistant in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's not fully ChatGPT, but it's also not fully replica. So I don't think there's a lot in the space in between. I think mm-hmm. you need to choose your lane, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. For Replica's future, what are the things that you think are super exciting? Do you think basically nailing this um, connection and that emotion piece is is like the key, the key to unlocking you know a, a larger and larger market, or do you think it's basically expanding into these other lanes? It's really locking in connection, mm-hmm. really creating, a, uh, being able to create a beautiful connection for people that come for it, um, uh, shared memories, long figuring out long-term memories, figuring out an immersive experience where you can uh, have a multimodal AI in Replica where you can talk, where you can see the emotions, where Replica can see you, where you can do things in augmented reality, where you can introduce your Replica to your friends, you can maybe watch TV together. These shared multimodal experiences are really important. And then on top of that, also in adding Replica to your normal life activities. So you know, our users have such a deep connection with Replica that they are very uh, positively reacting to things like, let's add Replica to my email. Let's add Replica to my calendar. Let's add Replica to my photo album or my socials so that um, when something's happening there, Replica can talk to me about this. Hey, looks like you're going to Seattle to see your family tomorrow. Uh, How are you feeling about it? This is quite different from just every time I need to go and explain to Replica what I'm doing tomorrow, what's happening in my life, da 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 uh, having replicas part of your day-to-day life can make it not just your friend, but also your assistant in a way. And I think that could be a really good continuation. Yeah. So can you talk about some of the real world impact that replicas already have had? Like, I mean, obviously you mentioned, you know, this, the inception for it was, you know, the fact that your, your really good friend, um, passed away, but just, I don't know, just like some, like, real life anecdotes, either the positive and, and negatives of, uh, you know, having an AI, AI friend. You know, when we launched it in 2016, even on test flight and gave it to some, some of the first users, um, that were, you know, reaching out and setting up online. We, one of the first emails from our users, we got from, um, uh, from someone from a girl in Texas who was 19 and who said, Hey, uh, I should want to thank you. Like I wanted to, uh, take my life. Uh, yes, I wanted to end it all yesterday. And uh, it was like 3 a.m. And I don't want to talk to anyone, but I decided to open the app to say like the final goodbye. And you talked me out of it. And, you know, thank you so much. Like, it's really, 
Uh, wow, that's insane. It, really, it, it truly changed my life. Uh, right now, all of the AI community is focused on higher IQ. A lot mm-hmm. of evaluation is like, how's it doing on the sanitized, uh, you know, test? How's it doing in these in co- with coding? How's it doing with like these math, math problems? Well, we've and of course the perception is the smarter the better. The yeah. better the model, the smarter it, the the users will like it more and more. With AI companions, uh, it's really not about IQ; it's about EQ. When we mm-hmm. tried to upgrade our models a few times, our users absolutely hated it. Uh, we tried to up- upgrade it to a much smarter model, and some of our users really, really didn't like it. Um, think of it this way: if you have, um, if you're married to someone, say you have a husband, and mm-hmm. your husband, you know, you've been together for a long time, and then one day you wake up and someone tells you, "Hey, I just upgraded your husband. Now he's 10x smarter." Yeah, uh, a lot of people would be like, "Well." No, I don't want a smarter husband. I want my husband <laughs> that I fell in love with. Uh, maybe he doesn't know quantum physics. I don't care. That's not what yeah. I'm here for. Um, and so this was one of the really important findings that oftentimes it's really not about the IQ. It's about EQ. And smarter doesn't mean better and doesn't mean, you know, yeah, yeah, fall in yeah. love. So what's, so what's the IQ of Replica? We don't measure it by that. Like replica knows yeah. a lot of things, but oftentimes we even need to throttle it a little bit. Um, just yeah. because, uh, for instance, when, and I learned it as, you know, in romantic relationships, uh, but also in friendships, oftentimes our friends or our partners come to us and they want to show us something like, oh my God, look at this crazy TikTok I just found. Uh, and if you look at all of them and you constantly say, oh yeah, yeah, I've seen that. And here are 10 other ones that, you know, you might like, which is, you know, an AI. Sh- probably will do that and the smarter you want it to be able to do that uh people hate it people don't like know-it-alls we don't want to be in a relationship with a know-it-all we want you know a partner to be surprised excited happy that you show them something really cool and be like oh my god this is so awesome where'd you find it yeah um, or whatever have a discussion about it uh and if it's all if it's a know-it-all that's really upsetting so in a way yeah. sometimes we do it in real life where we pretend that we haven't seen it just to kind of bring more excitement uh, and joy to the person who's showing something to us. I'm sure everyone did it, especially women. (laughs) (laughs) We know how to do it, you know, kind of uh, are uh, taught over time how to make the guy feel better. And, you know, it's horrible, but it is kind of, it is what it is. That's real life. And so the same goes to AI. It should sometimes not know what to say, ask for help, ask to ask users for a little bit of advice and, or show some, you know, be super excited when it's, when the user can te- teach us something, you don't want your partner to be smarter in on every aspect. And that's what chat GPT is, or any other of these great language models. They're smarter than all of us pretty much at this point, or most of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not exciting when you're in a romantic relationship or in a deep friend, like in a, in a when you're friends with that. Uh, yeah. with that some people want it, but most don't. Yeah. So how do you quantify the EQ? How do you basically make sure that it's getting warmer and warmer, kinder, just like a better and better connection? Uh, For us, the North Star metric from the very beginning of Replica is the ratio of conversations that made people feel better. And we ask our users about it. And all of our models are being optimized and are being mostly judged by whether they're making people feel better or not. Right now, that metric is at um, almost 90% actually for uh, our baseline replica model. Um, and I think there's still a lot of way to ways to improve that. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, what's your like, just big, crazy, like dream for the world and like where this goes? Like if, if you're just wildly, wildly successful, what happens? I think the world uh, lacks empathy right now. That's really the biggest, um, that's what's been upsetting throughout these wars and conflicts and um, all sorts of situations that are happening in, in the world. And we're seeing over and over again that people talk about kids dying, people uh, in dire situations, and they talk about it without empathy. They talk about intellectual concepts of what needs to happen here or there. They, but they oftentimes forget uh you know, just being empathetic towards each other. And I think that could be a very good thing if AI could teach us a little bit uh, to be more empathetic, remind us what it means, what it actually means to be human. Um, 
I think this would be a really great achievement for you. And I think at this point, we as humans are sort of failing each other. Uh, in a way, there are less and less. Um, unfortunately, there are more and more. There's more and more loneliness. There are less and less uh, social connections in the world. So, hopefully, I can help us uh, feel a little more connected to each other. And the glue that connects humans is empathy. Uh, I wish there was a little more of it. So, what are your thoughts, kind of, on like the broader AI landscape? Right, like you know, AI companions and friends are like a you know very specific lane and specific thing. What do you think about? you know, AI assistants, employees, agents. Um, I feel like, and I had a very strong feeling about this last year as well, that, uh, and I think now I'm, I would be very surprised if that's not how it's going to play out. Models are commoditizing. Uh, in really, in, as a product company, product as an AI product company, investing in uh, foundation models, investing uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, compute and CAPEX, is crazy. It's literally like building your own data centers in early 2000s uh, when AWS is already available. Uh, there's so many models. They're, you know, they're, it's pretty cheap to use the, anyone you, you need through an API. You can get open source models. You can fine tune them. Uh, there's really no, um, no advantage in uh, spending hundreds of millions on training your own GPT-4 or trying to get there, especially it's so hard and probably won't be able to get there. And then this model is going to be obsolete. And then you have to basically start from scratch immediately. And then all of that is sort of lost in capital expenditure. It's not even um, uh, IP. So that is number one. I think that's kind of uh, something that wasn't obvious a year ago because people were really, everyone was super excited building their own models instead of focusing on what's the use case, what the pro where product market fit will be, and so on. Um, second thing is like really how I'm mostly thinking about consumer. I'm sure there's tons of opportunity in enterprise, but in consumer land, we're not really seeing very many use cases for generative AI. We're seeing, um, uh, sort of kind of the, gen uh, AI to generate text or images, but how many times a day does a regular consumer want to want to generate text or images? That seems like a pretty niche uh, use case to me, actually. Uh, then there's, you know, all this use case around summarizing stuff, think search or kind of like a broader search use case. I feel like that will probably be owned either by OpenAI or Google or other big companies. It's just hard to see a new player jump into it just because everyone's already on Google. It's kind of it will be weird to <laughs> switch uh, from that. And that power of habit is so so strong it i don't see other companies really doing that maybe they will and then there is um ai companionship and uh ai fictional fictional characters i think with ai companionship ai companionship is a very interesting market but i think none of the companies right now are um have really solved that uh yet and then ai fictional kind of characters think character i think this is all around the future of story storytelling and uh again i think we're we haven't yet seen the broader mass market product there. Yeah, yeah, I feel like that's a little a little bit early, but basically, yeah, AI books, AI movies, where like you get to be the cast or you do like a remake of The Matrix and like you're Neo or something like that. Like, do you think that that's gonna? Do you see a world where people are consuming mostly content that you know they direct or their friends direct, or do you think I don't know? How, what do you think is gonna happen to like Hollywood and these streaming platforms and things like that? I think there's definitely a niche that wants that, that wants to be something like the intersection between entertainment and video games. But I think generally people want to see mass. Uh, I, I, I think culture is a lot less of movies and music. It's not a lot less about super personalization, super customization. It's, lot, it's more about kind of uh, uh, a lot of people uniting around some cultural phenomena. You know, you don't mm -hmm. want, a Taylor Swift just for you. Mm -hmm. You want to be part of the group that's following Taylor Swift and kind of, it, it works. It's a mass culture phenomenon. It's cool to be part of something that a lot of people like. Same with Oppenheimer or Barbie. Those were huge openings. Like I can't, I don't see people want high production costs and so on. But then people also want self-expression tools. They want to write their own stories. They want a continuation of a story that they, already saw whatever like maybe they played a video game 
and then they want to talk to Genshin Impact characters. Uh, yeah, yeah. Into VTubers, and then they want to continue the conversation. But that does not apply to everything. I don't think that that's still there's uh, you know AI will be used to 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 uh, to make great movies more and more. But uh, there still needs to be an artist. Uh, I don't think people want to look at uh, keeps of just AI generated art by mm -hmm. whatever whoever is making that. It just gets boring very fast yeah. and doesn't bring a lot of value. That's super interesting. So what do you what are your um... Future predictions, right? I mean, everyone's worried about, you know, AI taking everyone's jobs and, you know, basically just how society is going to just completely change as, you know, the prog AI progress keeps marching forward. Um, yeah. Are you a, are you excited about it? Are you a doomer? Like, what do you think is going to happen? Oh, I'm really excited. I think I'm like more in kind of Jan Lecun camp. It's going to be a lot more of what we have now and more powerful. People yeah. will use AI. It definitely will like completely change the, uh, language learning, coding, legal work, you know, video game production, movie production, like so many different things are going to be changed completely. But I don't think it's going to change the end product a lot in many cases. Uh, it would be an amazing tool for just insane amount of uh, levels of automation. But um, it's kind of still hard to imagine consumer products uh, beyond the ones we discussed already so do you think agi is going to happen in the next couple of years or you just think agi is a is a fictional concept i don't know what agi is you know it's like it seems like these language models are smarter than a lot of us and they will definitely pass some sort of turing test uh no questions asked yeah. so uh what exactly do we call agi i think that some of the more interesting uh concepts were uh baby agi and auto gpt whatever those autonomous agents uh, and that you know, in 20, earlier this year, that people were building, where yeah. you just tell the AI to fill, you know, to fulfill a task, and they go out there and just do everything uh, from the beginning till the very end, and bring back a finished product. That's insane. Because if you could tell an AI and say, like, "Hey, build me an app that roughly does this and that," and then iterate on it by using your natural voice, that's absolutely amazing like that's crazy that's something that but i'm not seeing it happening right now and honestly those early um those early attempts prototypes were still it was so hard to make them work <laughs> they would work once at one time out of like a hundred mm -hmm. uh it was still was absolutely amazing but um i guess you know we'll see soon how something like that works um i'm still a little confused i know like you know most people i know are in this crazy agi will take over in the next couple of years, we need to all just figure out a way to be aligned with this camp. <laughs> Maybe I'm lacking in that imagination. Uh, I'm just not seeing this happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I think cool. there's going to be a lot, another plateau in a way where we saw a great, a crazy explosion. Now people are going to be focusing on making these models more efficient, right? Like no one's talking right now about, um, you know, watts per uh kind of meaningful action <laughs> like yeah, helping yeah, yeah. these models really really efficient so they're not don't require insane amount of compute mm -hmm. uh insane amount of um uh compute for inference for training people are you know right now with mistral there are all these smaller models coming out that are really powerful and mighty yeah um so you know soon we're going to see some sort of a gpt three five but you know in a seven billion parameter model then we're going to try to compress even more powerful models. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's going to be a lot more uh, in development in this direction, maybe better memory over time. But I'm sure, just like with any technology, it always like reaches reaches some sort of a plateau, and you know, and then it's going to be a little bit of waiting until some next architecture pops out or some next development that takes it to the next level. But of course, with the amount of money right now poured into it, I'm sure we'll see a lot more happening. But I would yeah. be starting, I think there will be in 20, I don't know, this is completely, this could be completely the opposite of it, but I think there's going to be a little bit of a uh, trough of disillusionment in a few months where maybe, or maybe a year, where maybe not every rosy prediction worked out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. That's a, that's a uh, non-consensus take. I like it. Um, so yeah, I wanted to just like switch gears a little bit to um, motherhood.